or I forgot to do that, Mr. Chair. <laughs> and just say we had a good day in the forest. Oh, well, we did. We had a great day in the forest today. And, and uh, again, uh, we'd like to thank staff for that. Uh, we'll begin our meeting with the land acknowledgement statement. The Pagan-Araska Conservation Authority respectfully acknowledges that the land on which we gather is situated within the tra traditional and treaty territory of the Mississaugas and Chippewas of the Anishinaabe, known today as the Williams Treaty's First Nations. Our work on these lands acknowledges their resilience and their longstanding contributions to the area. We are thankful for the opportunity to live, learn, and share with mutual respect and appreciation. Is there anyone with any disclosure of pecuniary interest for the meeting today? Seeing none, we have the minutes of the uh, September 21st meeting. Can I have a mover to approve those, please? Mover by Vicky, second by uh, Joan. All in, all in favor? That's carried. Okay. Can we the adoption of today's agenda, please? Mover for today's agenda. Adam, seconder, Miriam. All in favor? And that's carried. Then we'll move down to presentations. And we have the Wilmot Graven Creek floodplain mapping update study. And Corey, I guess you're going to take over here. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, can everyone see that? Great. Okay, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to take a few minutes today to walk through some slides to uh, advise the board of the uh, finalization of, of this important study. Uh, some of you know, we've been working away for the last couple of years on getting the Wilmont Grand Creek uh, floodplain mapping updated. So I'm just gonna to touch on a few things as you can see in the outline. Um, just touch on the background need for the study, give a, a reference to the guidance documents that are used to direct this work, um, talk about the work that we did, touch on the use of our, our web map viewer for public engagement, uh, and then just talk about the, the wrap up of the project and endorsement of, of this project. So um, to give you a sense of the need for this study. The original mapping for Wilmot and Graham Creek watersheds from 1977. And that makes it over 45 years old. And although that's not old for a lot of us, <laughs> when it comes to mapping, that's pretty old. Um, many things have changed since this original study was done. Things like land uses. Uh, we've got, in some cases, up, updated culvert and bridge structures. Uh, the use of geographic information systems. That's a, basically a foundational shift in, in how we do our, our work. Uh, even the modeling software has come a long way and the mapping standards have, have actually changed since the original work was done. Um, the original models are not available digitally. And I bring this, uh, this little piece of paper here. Um, the original model was in this format. Does anyone recognize this? That's the key. Yeah. This is a punch card. <laughs> <laughs> so we had some boxes upstairs of punch cards that I just couldn't do anything with. So um, it's important that we got this work updated and basically we had to recreate all these models from scratch. So uh, we now represent watersheds using geographic information systems. Um, we've basically created um, new digital models for both the hydrology of the watershed as well as the hydraulics for the floodplains. Um, we're updating drainage areas and subcatchments, all the land use information, the soils, structure data, uh, channel information, etc. So this updated mapping will provide the latest and greatest data to assist with emergency preparedness planning, um, you know, delineating our floodplain hazards as well as uh, looking at using it for flood prevention and mitigation purposes. So just to give you a sense of what the old mapping looked like, and I have to say that the quality of the old mapping is excellent. It was done by uh, Dylan Consulting. Um, this is just an example of Liz, the Liskard area. Um, 
just near the 115 south of 407, or actually just north of 407. So this is what the mapping um, for the little community of Lisker looks like. If you zoom in, you can see it's on a contour map base. Um, the black lines uh, along the creeks are basically the estimation of where the floodplain um, flood plains are, are going to be. And then you've got the approximate regulation limits in those dashed lines outside of the floodplain. So, so over the course of the lifetime of this mapping, it has been an excellent tool to direct people out of the floodplain. Um, but it's reached a point where it's no longer uh, functional, especially if we can't update the models. Uh, one of the things that's um, highlighted the need for good mapping is um, the province put together the flooding strategy for Ontario. This was produced in 2020. And the top priority is understanding flood risks. So it's really important that we keep our models up to date um, for planning and and other purposes. So the project area is both the Wilmont Creek, which is on the west or the left side of the screen and to the west, and Graham Creek is on the lower right side. And you'll see that little gap in the middle, that's Foster Creek. Um, that has had some mapping updates in recent years, uh, essentially it's 2015 and 2019. Um, there's some work that's going to be done in that area just to merge those two models into one and that's uh, that wasn't included as part of this, this study. So there's a lot of guidance documents available to to present the standards and uh, the criteria that we have to follow when we're developing these these types of products. Uh, so the three main ones that we'll talk about here is the province's river and streams systems flood hazard limit limit. Um, that's the technical guide that MNRF has put out to guide floodplain mapping for Ontario. The one in the middle is a, uh, a technical guideline for flood hazard mapping, and it was done by the Greater Toronto Area Conservation Authorities, and we were part of that project to establish those guidelines. Um, and that, that's a bit more modern. The MNRF one is from 2002. This one is from 2017, so it it actually addresses things like using LIDAR, um, you know, looking at accuracy standards for use of LIDAR in mapping and that sort of thing. And recently, as, as recently as 2019, the federal government has come out with hydrologic and hydraulic procedures for mapping floodplains. That's the document on the right. So the work that was done, as mentioned, we recreated both the hydrology and hydraulic models. We did use the 2016 provincial LIDAR data uh, that the province produced. That was integrated with new uh, national vertical data standards, <clears throat> which is referenced uh, as Canadian Geodetic Vertical Datum 2013 or CGVT 2013 as it's known. Um, we also surveyed in excess of 400 culvert and bridge structures within Clarington and Durham. And that was a lot of work. Um, I'll leave it there. <laughs> We had a public information center in Newcastle on the 20th of March. And um, there's a couple of pictures on the slide here. You can see we had a pretty good turnout. And what we did as part of that, um, we produced a mapping portal where the, the public could view, basically look up their property, view the new mapping relative to the 20, or the 1977 mapping. So at the PIC, we had computers set up where people could come and we would guide them through that process as to how to do that. And that was a, that was a big hit. Um, it just, I think people really appreciated having someone there to guide them through that process. So it was, it was successful. Um, we did receive comments from the public uh, up until about the end of March, final draft maps and reports were prepared. We did circulate these documents also to the uh, staff at the municipality of Clarington and we received comments from them in August. Um, those were incorporated into the final version of the reports and the mapping, which was prepared and finalized over the last two months. So just to give you a sense of some of the uh, culmination and, and presentation of the work, this is the updated land use layer for the study area. Uh, we've updated soil mapping for use in the models. <clears throat> and then we've updated the subcatchment uh, information for, for both systems. 
Um, so just a couple of slides here on the web map viewer. This was on our website. So we would refer people to that. And I think this is the way we're going to do things going forward for any mapping updates. Um, so basically the, the public can go in, they can look up their property, they can turn on different layers. They can see the digital elevation model and the hill shade, which shows you the relief um, on the landscape. And then you can turn uh, the, air, the 2018 air photo on. And you can also see the buildings and uh, the limits of both the old and the new floodplain, so you can see the differences in the mapping. A couple examples. This is um, Wilmot Creek as it comes through Orono. So the blue is the old mapping, and the red is the new. So you can see, although the flows are a little bit different than the original study, um, there's a lot of similarities, but the, the accuracy and the new mapping is really a direct result of the use of of that recent LIDAR data. Um, you have a much better represent, representation of terrain and, and contours and so on. Um, I think the difference there with, with the, um, in the center of the screen was there was a larger structure put in since the original study. So that's why the floodplain looks a little bit smaller. So this new mapping will reflect those types of changes. Uh, this is an example of uh, Wilmot Creek at 401. What I just want to point out here, is um, the flows are a bit bigger for the Hurricane Hazel event uh, for this portion of the Wilmot Creek, but the railway tracks of the 401 is a is a big challenge in uh, just hydraulically. It's a pinch point, and so you can see underneath this red layer is the blue 1977 mapping. Um, so we were seeing significant impacts on the floodlines for the new updated model, given the uh, hydraulic constraints of the, of the railway track. And it went up, I think, about approximately a meter uh, immediately upstream of the structure, and that has impacts to the 401 under the, the Hurricane Hazel event. Um, you also note there's a, a fire station at the top center of the screen. I don't know if you can see my mouse. It was out of the floodplain. Now it's, uh, it's in. So. The depths aren't significant, but that's something that um, you know we would need to communicate to the fire department just so that they're aware of that. Uh, another example, just to look at Graham Creek. This is Highway Two as you're coming into Newcastle, um, and you can see the railway track curving down and heading in a southerly direction. So um, you can see the the changes to the floodplain through here. The blue is is clearly um, you know, the 1977 mapping. So areas that were impacted previously are shown as not to be impacted now. And on the flip side, floodplain has gotten a little bit bigger upstream of the railway tracks. And again, it's because of the hydraulic constraints with the, the structure there. So it is it is a, a better representation of what, what will actually flood when a major event like this happens. So, what do our maps look like? This is a, an example of that same area just as from the previous slide. It's Highway 2 and the, and the railway tracks. Uh, so you'll see we, we do depict the flood, flood line in red. It's kind of tough to see at this scale, but um, we've got contours to show the, the relief and the topography. And then you'll see these black lines that cross the floodplains. And in these little bubbles is the flood elevation of the uh, regional storm or the Hurricane Hazel event, as well as the 100 year storm. Um, so, this is what gets used on a day to day basis by planning staff when they're looking up uh, flood levels at, at various properties. So, next steps. Uh, once the mapping for the projects endorsed by the board tonight, we will uh, package everything up and deliver uh, the products to the National Disaster Mitigation Program. They were funders or co-funders of this project. So we will send them the deliverables that we, we promised to do. And then we will share the mapping with uh, the final mapping with Clarington staff as well as region and Durham staff. And that's going to be used to inform land use and emergency management planning at their end. Um, the mapping will in turn be used to update our regulation limits. And then um, the mapping is actually also going to be used for future risk assessment work with the region of Durham to uh, look at risk levels for all the road crossings within Durham 
our portion of Durham region. So um, it's going to be really helpful information. And just a quick shout out to the partners and funders, uh, the municipality of Clarington, the region of Durham, they produced 50% of the funding and that was matched by Public Safety Canada through the NDMP program. And that's it. So I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Uh, questions from? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no, we need to put it there. And, and show down the bottom. Okay. There. <clears throat> then my yep. Great. Great. Thank you, Corey. Any questions for Corey on this? Adam? Yes? What a great presentation, appreciate it. Okay. So through the chair, yeah. um, if you don't mind me asking, uh, the Clarington Fire Station 2, you said is now on the fire plan? It's within, yes. Or within, sorry. Um, how does that affect them if they need to do upgrades to their building in the future because it's under the emergency, uh, the emergency services? Yeah. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think if, if it came in as a development application, we would work with them to address the risk. Um, and the nice thing about this, like being in the floodplain is not really nice at the best of times, but um, in looking at the flood depths through there, they were pretty minimal. I think they're about 0.3 meters. Uh, and that's at the peak of a hurricane hazel storm. So I think if they were to put on any um, additions or wanted to enlarge that site we would just want them to flood proof those additional features as as necessary um, but in terms of the operation you know, we would certainly not put any restrictions on them we would just want them to be aware that just, just for building right yeah yeah okay. and if flooding was to occur um, you know we would be warning them as part of our our normal flood forecasting and warning program uh, requirements Thank you. Welcome. Great. Uh, I'm glad you asked that because I was going to ask almost something. Okay. okay. <laughs> but, uh, anyone else with a comment or question? Uh, Vicki, sorry. Um, so, again, in the chair, thank you. Great presentation. Um, the private property owners, obviously, some of them now have more restrictions. They're learning, correct? So, properties that used to be in the floodplain, like if you look at the ones in Newcastle there, are they just given the clear now that their, their conditions have changed, or is that still a precaution? Off. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess if if there have been reductions in floodplain limits on those properties, that if they were to come in for any kind of application, we would apply this new mapping and um, you know make sure that they were aware of, of those changes as it applied to their application. And and that's one of the main reasons why we wanted to have the public engagement through this portal, because it was such a helpful tool in letting people see that. Um, while the floodplain mapping is a little different, it's, it's an improved situation for some people, maybe, you know, had impacts to others, but um, it's really the bottom line is getting the best information out there so people can plan and make decisions with, with that information. Interesting. Okay. okay. Miriam? Thank you very much. Welcome. Very interesting. Uh, my question has to do uh, with um, how much of the GRCA jurisdiction area has this type of level of units and um, uh, are there other watersheds that are um, in line to, to receive this sort of review and documentation? For you, Mr. Chair, that's actually the topic of my next presentation. <laughs> great great it's a question. <laughs> You yes. Now, through you, Chair, now that this has been put in place, um, when people come in to access this information, are they charged for the information? So it's a bit of a cost recovery um, in planning situations? Through you, Mr. Chair, and, and Ken can jump in on this if uh, he feels, but basically, we feel our role as regulators of, of these flood and erosion hazards is we don't want to charge people to come in and look at mapping. We want the information to get out there so people can use it and make good informed decisions on whether they buy a property or whether they want to 
in what they want to do with I was thinking uh, down the road maybe for subdivisions and things like that, mm -hmm. but that maybe wouldn't be there. But if they're coming in to do something like that, I'm just wondering if there would be a cost recovery. To you, Mr. Chair, there, there, we do have in place uh, charges um, that are imposed upon people who are inquiring. We have an inquiry process, and there is an initial fee of three hundred dollars that we would charge to somebody who is interested in developing that lot. Would have that initial fee uh, that that is charged to them, and uh, that, and beyond that, there are the planning act application fees and so yeah, fees yeah. down the road. So yes, there is there are fees associated with these. And for you, Mr. Chair, if I could just add, um, in terms of like, viewing the mapping, we, we want this to be on our website so they can actually view the mapping for free. But I think in Ken's example, if they want something documented in a letter with an official map, then we would charge a fee for that. But in terms of viewing it on the web, there's absolutely no charge to that. Absolutely. Okay, okay great. Uh, any other further questions? Uh, there being none, uh, we have a notion that you know, we receive the presentation for information purposes and further the, the floodplain mapping for the Wilmot Graham Creek watersheds as described in this report be adopted for the use of the Gannon Rapid Conservation Authority. So we were to do that. Adam, second by Tracy. All in favor? That's carried. Okay, we have another presentation by Corey, and he's going to be talking about floodplain mapping update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this um, this presentation is just to give you the Coles notes version of the report that was attached to uh, the staff report. Um, and I think this is this is timely because, uh, and I'll get into this a bit more in the presentation. But funding for mapping updates is hard to find, so. Um, we, we need to make hay while the sun shines, I think. Um, so with that, just I want to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to touch on. I'm, I want to give you some context about uh, updating mapping, why are mapping updates important, um, talk about the state of GRCA's mapping, the history of, of funding programs, uh, where do we need to go to get our mapping up to date, and, and how do we get there. So in terms of context, uh, mapping natural hazards is is a delegated responsibility from the province of Ontario to the conservation authorities. Uh, in areas where you don't have conservation authorities, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry is is really uh, tasked with, with preparing that mapping in partnership with with their municipalities. Um, flood management really has three pillars: prevention, protection, and emergency response. Uh, mapping plays a role in all three. Um, but prevention is really the most cost-effective way to, to manage hazards. Identify them, stay away from them, and uh, you know, if you have a historic community that's within them, you, you can at least make good decisions on, on knowing where the flooding is going to occur. Floodplain mapping is really foundational to understanding the watershed and supports all three of those flood management pillars. So you've seen the slide. Just a few minutes ago, I just want to reiterate, the province has said priority number one is understanding flood risks. So I won't dwell on that. <laughs> um, what's also important to point out here, as you may recall with some of the recent changes to the Conservation Authorities Act, there were um, mandatory services regulations that were released. Uh, this is six regulation 686.1. And you'll see right in the reg, it says, uh, where the authority considers it advisable to help ensure it complies with its obligation to provide the programs, and services described in the reg, um, these, these elements need to be considered. So um, we're really responsible for delineating and mapping areas of natural hazards within our jurisdiction. We need to study water, surface water hydrology and hydraulics, including surface water flows and levels and how that interacts with, with groundwater. <clears throat> That's the importance of a hydraulic or hydrologic model. And study the, the potential effects of climate change on natural hazards. So why are these mapping updates important? Models need to be current to reflect changes in land use. That was kind of touched on in the previous presentation. 
Conservation authorities provide mapping and models to our municipal partners, to the consulting community, um, which do the work for the developers. Um, and it's really also to quantify flood risks and test the impacts of development. Uh, we need to update models to complete risk assessments for covert and bridge infrastructure. And this goes hand in hand with asset management planning by our municipal partners. It helps them uh, rank and prioritize their infrastructure relative to risk. That's what that bullet's about, inform and prioritize asset management planning. And last but not least, it, it's really helpful to have an up-to-date model so you can test climate change scenarios to make our communities more resilient. So a, a quick overview of the, the history, the funding history for floodplain mapping in Ontario. You'll see uh, the original program, it's called the FDRP program or the Flood Damage Reduction Program. That was in place for 20 years from 1976 to 1996. Uh, and that's what a lot of the mapping across Canada was produced uh, through, through the help of. And that was a federal and provincial partnership um, to offset the costs to the municipalities on getting good mapping for their communities. Um, in 2015 to 2022, the feds uh, put together the National Disaster Mitigation Program, or NDMP as it's called. Uh, that's That was winding down in 2022. So in 2021, they um, uh, was through Natural Resources Canada, not Public Safety Canada. Uh, they created the Flood Hazard Identification and Mapping Program, or as we call the FIM program. And so uh, on, on the same vein, I guess, uh, I just wanted to show this slide to point out there was a 20, almost a 20 year gap in, in any federal or provincial funding. To, to update flood by mapping. And I don't know if 96 was, well, I won't, I won't talk politics. Uh, I'll just leave that. <laughs> <totally in silence. laughs> but anyway, there was a big gap there. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave that alone. Um, so, so when you look at, you ask the question, GRCA, why the heck is your mapping so old? Well, this is why, because to dump all that responsibility on a municipality, it's just, it's expensive. Um, it, it's important work, and it's it's getting more affordable because of the the tools and the technology. But it's still, you know, it costs costs a pretty penny. So uh, I just want to point that out. So you can see the FDRP program at the start. The NDMP program kind of came to the rescue for a bit. It, it's done now, and here we have the uh, the FIM program kind of picking up the reins. So one of the things that I want to drive home here, one of the points, so if you remember anything from this talk tonight, or this, this presentation, please remember this. Um, so yeah, NDMP program is winding down. The FIMP program is now um, active. And we just heard this month that they are, uh, Natural Resources Canada is extending this program for another four years. So that's really, really good news. Um, but what that means to us is we need to have some conversations with our municipal partners to talk about um, what projects, what update projects are your priorities. Because through this document here that I, I put together, um, I've identified what our priorities are, but that can be subject to change based on what the, uh, the municipal partners want to see done. So, um, so we are expecting um, intakes, application intakes to, to open up in the coming months. Um, and we want to be ready for those. What's what's kind of frustrating is that <clears throat> these programs don't really take into account the cycles of budgets <laughs> for municipalities. Um, they can announce them any time of year, but for us to, to get those conversations and secure matching dollars to leverage those federal dollars, you almost have to start that a year ahead of time. So um, that's why I just really want to drive home that because of this announcement, we need to have some more discussions in, in short order. So what we're hoping to do is after we have those discussions, um, you know, let's figure out what projects need to be updated 
uh, and leverage those federal dollars to get this work done. So one thing I just want to point out as an example, and I, I think some of the members may have recalled this uh, from a year and a half ago when I touched on the age of our mapping in a, in a presentation. This is a tangible example of what happens when you don't have up-to-date models. So this, we were working with Port Hope. Um, they did an environmental assessment to upgrade the Sylvan Glen Bridge. Uh, this was the mapping on the Ganaraska River through there. Um, again, the quality of the mapping is very good. It's just I don't have a digital model to give to their consultant to test bridge scenarios and sizing and optimize the design of the bridge through the EA. What I did as a stock gap measure was I used our LIDAR uh, for this area. I took the flows from the previous model from the 80s and I quickly recreated a hydraulic model through the reach so that they could at least have a hydraulic model to use and to test for the EA. Uh, ideally, that would have been ready and off the shelf that I could have given to them, but um, we weren't in that position. So uh, as part of this, this report, we did compile a map of the status and the vintage of floodplain mapping across the watershed. So you can see the, the image here. Um, Anything that's red is from the 70s. Red is bad, <laughs> not bad. I should rephrase that. It, it just means it needs help. It needs updating. It's old. It's old. <laughs> old is not bad. Um, so we've got things uh, from, if you're from the 80s, it's, it's orange. Uh, the lighter orange, I think it's from, uh, yeah, the 90s. Yellow is from the early 2000s, light green is from the 20 teens, and then the darker green is hot off the press. So you can see in this, this slide, we just finished Wilmot and Graham, that's the green area here. And if you look closely, there's a hatching on these tributaries up in the Northwest Ganaraska, as well as these smaller trips down <clears throat> at the bottom end of Clarington. Those are being updated right now through federal funding and, and regional Durham funding. Uh, we're hoping to have that done next spring. Um, but everything else, you know, is is in need of an update. And, and what we wanted to try and achieve through this exercise was ranking um, ranking those other systems using a, a matrix. And I'll talk about that here. So yeah, there's the color scheme. One of the reasons we have to update mapping as well is, is the federal government has produced a new vertical datum standard for Canada, um, and that's the CGBD 2013 I was talking about. Um, it's replacing CGBD 28, which was based on monuments along highways and, and roads. And when you apply that to Canada, by the time you're out in the prairies, you're off by over a meter. So. Um, CGVD 2013 is a much better representation of um, vertical heights for Canada and, and North America. So, so what that means is all the LIDAR data, all the topographic information that's coming out is, is in this new standard. So when I update a hydraulic model, all the old bridge information is in the old standard. And so what that means is there's a few structures that have to be resurveyed. Um, so we've done over 400 in, in Durham and Clarington, um, but we have to extend that work into the rest of the watershed to get all those other structures into the new national standard. So that's going to take a bit of work. Uh, and in my discussions with our partners, my view is that um, we try to cobble together some resources to get two crews of summer students to try and get this work done so that by the time, if we're successful in our applications, this stuff's already available and we can move into getting the modeling done. <clears throat> so this just gives you a sense of how many structures within the area around the office are, are uh, in need of updates. <clears throat> so where do we need to go? We need to create an update and maintain our digital uh, hydrology and hydraulic models for all of our watersheds. 
Uh, this does provide up-to-date estimations of floodplain limits for planning, regulatory, and emergency management purposes. The models can be modified and regular, regularly updated easily at low cost just by staff when they are in a digital format. And we can use these models to test climate change scenarios. Uh, also, and this is something that's really important to us, is it, it really enables us to share data and provide good client service to our partners and to the development community. So in terms of this study, um, the methodology we use, it's, it's qualitative, but at least was enough to give us a ranking system. So each water course was reviewed and ranked for age of hydrology and hydraulic models, as well as the age of mapping, and then the risk levels within each system. So uh, the models and mapping were given a score from one to four, one being hot off the press, four being Old, but not bad. <laughs> Hazard levels were also given a score of one to four, one being low risk, four being high risk. And the risk levels also included if development um, is planned for an area in the future that we have to have regard for that, that might increase the score a bit because we want to have mo uh, updated modeling and mapping to support that development as it moves forward. And I'm bringing up stuff like Wesleyville and, and areas that have hamlets that want to intensify. So, so all of these components were combined using this formula, adding up the scores for the age of the mapping and multiplying that by the level, the hazard level for that, that system. So you'll see in, in the report towards the end, on page seven and eight, um, we've, we've produced a ranking all the, all the systems in the watershed. So at the very bottom, you'll see the recently completed work or the stuff that's underway in, in Durham. Those scores are very low because they're very new. And at the top of the list, you'll see uh, Coburg Creek within the rural parts of the watershed. So outside of uh, the town of Coburg, the Camelton Township, and a little bit of Alderman Alderman, that, that's kind of at the top of the list because it is it is so dated. Um, and I've color coded these by municipalities. So Hamilton Township is um, kind of the orange color. Red is municipality of Fort Hope. Coburg is in blue. And then green is uh, municipality of Clarington. So, and again, this, this is our first cut at a ranking, but obviously these will be teased out and, and reprioritized given priorities that our partners have. So how do we get to the to the finish line? It's really uh, tonight, if the board is is willing uh, to endorse this plan, uh, it just facilitates discussions with our partners to pursue this uh, this plan to get this mapping updated. Uh, and importantly, we'd want to develop and finalize the work plans and the cost estimates uh, for each each project. Meet with our partners to establish their priorities uh, and you know, talk about available funding so that we can leverage those federal dollars. Um, and then we want to phase that work over the next four to five years to get all the watersheds up to date. And I just want to say, and I, I didn't put this in the presentation because it's not finalized yet, but I've put together a spreadsheet of, of cost estimates for all the creek systems. And there's some documents out there that give industry rates to do this work. I've converted those to $20, $23. If we were to do everything in the watershed, um, the number that comes out of that price is about 2.9 million. Oh, um, if we were to do that, there's a conservation authority price. It was in the order of 2.7 to 2.8. But we've gone through each project and looked at um, based on the projects we've done recently, what do we feel we could do it for? And we're in the ballpark of 1.6. So if we were to be able to phase that work over four years at 50%, it's a much more manageable price tag, I think, um, for the partners to get this work done. So, um, so I just, I, I didn't want to put that in the presentation formally, but I wanted to at least share those numbers, those preliminary numbers with you. <clears throat> So after this, we'll be recommending that the municipalities consider allocating funds. And I I put this in because 
when these application windows open, it's not in line with the budget cycle. So if there was interest in doing a municipal reserve to put some money aside so that when the windows open, it's accessible. Um, because I think time is of the essence as well in getting the applications in and securing that federal funding. So I think that's it. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you again, Corey, for your presentation. Question, Randy, you're here. So we can go to Thank you. Thank you for hiring a friend. I never thought I think we're taking two and a half hours or my last meeting was, so forgive me. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about the federal funding that you talked about a little bit earlier. Is that multi-year funding? It is, as opposed to just a year by year by year, you don't have to wait every time. Would it be what, a three or four or five year funding plan, is it roughly? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, what, what preliminary information we have is that um, they, they are extending the funding to 2028, to March of 2028, and they do allow uh, depending on the complexity of the project, they do allow multi-year um, phasing of, the, of that project. So maybe in a very complex um, situation, it might be a three-year project. But yeah, we I think we could develop work plans to try and work within those, basically the, the limitations that we have. So once you find out, you know, and it might be a while down the road yet, because it's not even released yet. But once you find that out, that will help you uh, plan in order then to uh, show the, the kind of effect it will have on the municipalities and what they need to do also. Right? Yeah, through yeah. you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Randy. Further questions? Yeah, Joan, I'm just trying to watch the screen. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll go to Joan and Miriam. Well, to you, Chair. Um, how much federal funding do you think uh, would be available for the, the would be full? Is there a percentage that you think the funding would be? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, that just like the NDMP program, it's the, the FIMP program is 50%. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. So if there's 50% matching available from the from the municipality or other partners, they will match that with 50% federal dollars. So that's why I'm trying to stress we've got that opportunity for the next four years. So let's make hay while the sun shines. Okay. Tell me you're good. Uh, Miriam? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, you may know that our longtime director of finance is retiring at the end of this month, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. his uh, next the, the person taking over has actually been sort of uh, shadowing him for this last month. The reason I mentioned that is when you uh, said uh, to meet with partners, um, is it preferable to meet with the appropriate staff, like the, the, the senior management team, um, and then find out, you know, the priorities there, or uh, alternatively, or maybe, you know, at the same time, making a presentation to council. We haven't really set our budget schedule, but I'm just trying to think of how, in our municipality, Coburg, how things are lining up, and if things will be moving very quickly. Um, and I, also, I'm aware with finding opportunities, once that window opens, you want to get in there, and uh, so, uh, thought uh, maybe you could clarify like what 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 would your recommended procedure be? For you, Mr. Chair, uh, I think step one is is meeting with staff. But I was looking at getting on uh, council agendas in in November to share this this plan with council if that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I've already emailed the plan to. Um, a number of our municipalities are not done yet, but I've sent it out to Coburg, um, Port Hope, as well as Hamilton Township. And I need to touch base with all the McCallum and, and, um, and Clarington, just because there are some other things to tie up there. Um, yeah, I, I think planning and public works and, and basically um, like those are the two departments that have the most interest in mapping. So I was going to meet with the directors of planning and the directors of public works, um, just so that they can have some conversations about how best to, I guess, present this work to to finance and many other departments. Um, but I'm flexible in how best to serve those partners in getting this information out. So, okay. anyone with any further questions, comments? Seeing none, I, I just have one quick one if I could, Corey. 
I look at your list, it looks pretty aggressive. Is this achievable, do you feel? I mean, from what the work you've already done and completed, do you feel that this is something that you can do? Yeah, through, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I do think it, yeah, it is aggressive, but I think it is achievable. And the reason I say that is a lot of the work that goes into these projects is preparation of, of base data, like base mapping, LIDAR, developing the terrain surfaces for these areas. We've already done that internally, just to serve staff for uh, planning purposes, but also on our other projects. So that shaves a lot of time off in the, uh, the preparation. It also does affect, like it reduces the costs because that preparatory work has been done. So it's really between the surveying and getting the models developed. And, and if we're focusing on that and we can get the surveying done in the next year or so, I think this is this is achievable. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll move on then. Um, I need a motion that the uh, Conservation Authority receives the information for, for the presentation for information purposes and the further that the floodplain mapping update implementation plan be approved by the NRS Commission Conservation Authority Board. Do you want to go further in, in, in dealing with the, with the uh, municipality? We have this followed up through with the municipalities. Well, that's part of the motion also. Um, it's up to you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm planning on doing that, but if you want to... Um, yeah, we should add that. It'd be nice to have that added. I would have put the amendment on the color and blue. I don't know. Can you do that? Or we'll just add it to the motion. Sure. We can add it to the motion now, or that it be followed up with the municipalities. It's, it's going to be aggressive, and, and he's going to need to know who's going to want what ASAP pretty well yeah. in order to get this done. Mm -hmm. So, Mary, you'll move that yeah. then as seconder. Second to move that to uh, Lance. All in favor? Let's carry it. Thank you. And next up, we have uh, business arising from our minutes, which is our 2024 preliminary budget and municipal levy report. And then there you go to speak on this. Or? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before you, you have the uh, the 2024 preliminary budget and municipal levy. Um, overall, I'll just make a couple of comments about the preliminary budget. So the preliminary budget is at currently sits at a reduced level overall um, from the 2023 budget. And that is because of programs and projects that we're doing under category two, meaning those projects that are funded directly by either municipalities or other partners such as um, a big a big uh, project that we're doing uh, with the uh, County of Halliburton for their floodplain mapping. That has been, we've been working on that over a couple of years um, in partnership with Halliburton and that is coming to an end. So that's, um, you know, in 2023, we had 250,000 uh, budgeted there. Um, as we've just seen the Clarington uh, and the MP floodplain mapping updates are done, the um, Brook Creek floodplain uh, flood mitigation and some of the other projects are, are completed. So this budget has been based on where we sit and what we know going, what we know going forward in 2024. It does not include any of the projects that we are in discussions with your staff. So while the budget um, is is looks to be you know roughly uh, three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand I can't remember the amount reduced um, it's because it's pre discussions with your staff and any new projects including um, a project you know such as doing the preliminary work that the surveying that may be done for for these projects so would be included in the final budget that is presented to this board in uh, April or May, normally April. Um, however, the levies have been, we received the um, MMAH current value assessments for our municipalities. And this staff report does show the, the uh, allocations according to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. 
And you can see on the chart that was included, um, any CVAs that have gone up, CVA being the current value assessment, or any that have gone down. So you can see that the Municipality of Clarington, Region of Durham, has increased while everybody else's has gone down with the uh, exception of the Township of Cabin Monaghan. It has slightly gone up from 0.1989 to 0.9990. So um, that is why when we say that the levy is at a 3.3% increase, it may not be a 3.3% increase for all municipalities. So on page, I, I will draw your attention um, on the budget to page 28. And that shows all the proposed general levies for your municipalities. And you can see that it shows the 2023 levy and then the 2024 levy. If this budget is, um, is received as uh, approved to be sent out, so it's not approved, we're not approving the budget. What we're doing is approving to send the budget out along with a cover letter that is sent to each municipality stating um, at today's meeting, the October 19th meeting, the budget was received with the municipal levies. Here is your municipal levy for 2024. And please be aware that um, and make note that the November meeting for this board in accordance with the meeting schedule that was passed at the annual meeting is November 23rd. We have to give all municipalities 30 days to review the levy. And last year, we, because of the way the municipal election fell, we decided to go with a December meeting. But normally in our budget year, we meet later in November and we don't have a meeting just because everybody's so busy um, at, in December. So the letter will uh, go out to your municipalities um, and you'll, you'll receive copies of the package. It will be sent by email. It will also be hand delivered or purulated um, either tomorrow or Monday. And mm -hmm. it will state that here is the levy for your consideration, 30 days. Um, if there's any uh, you know, feedback that, that is required and then the vote is done, it's a recorded vote and it is done in November on the November 23rd meeting. And um, then it's normally done by your weighted averages, except that we have to adjust those percentages because, and I'll explain this in November, but no one municipality can carry the vote um, more than 50%. So, um, so those are, are adjusted, but for the levy distribution, it's based on those. So again, it's we're, you're only looking at really page 28 because the budget is not finalized. There is a final budget um, presentation in April. But your levy distribution, for the most part, the general levy is distributed where it's said. It's just the, the other capital projects. There isn't really a change from the, the uh, distribution of the, the general levy. So thank you, Mr. Chair. There's any questions? Thank you, Linda. Questions for Linda? Joan? I'm to you, Chair. Just so I'm, I'm uh, got this right in my head. So it is the three percent, but then in April, you were looking at. Will you be going back to the municipalities for more money in April? No. Through you, Mr. Chair. No, we're only voting on the general levy. Any other, um, any other dollars that would be coming from your municipality? would be through capital projects that we do hand in hand with your municipalities. Uh, so, gotcha. and, and that's, and, and again, we're not going back to, because we've already got those agreements in place um, prior to it being in the budget. We do not put any capital projects in our budget that have not already been agreed to. Okay. Yeah, just for your information, quite often, even though we're asking, even though this percentage looks like 3.3, if everybody would remain the same, but with those special projects, if you've done them year after year, they stay fairly flat. So really our 3.3 .3 is usually less than 3.3 .3 that's being added. Mm -hmm. I hope I didn't confuse you with that. But that no, is, but I, 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 to you, Chair, I was just- The overall dollar, the, the overall dollar yeah. is less than- If we're doing cap through you, Mr. Chair, if we're doing capital projects with your municipality, lots of times, um, if we're doing clean water, healthy lands with your municipalities, it remains at $20,000 every year. 
um, that we're doing that with a few of the municipalities, and that's really that's why it stays flat. So it's really a percentage of reduced. Reduced. Okay. Any other questions for Linda? There being none, we have a motion then that the uh, board of directors receive the preliminary budget, the 2024 preliminary budget for information, and further the budget report to the watershed to the watershed municipalities, indicating in the cover letter that the vote to approve the 2024 levy will be taken in November 23rd, 2023, board of directors meeting. I move that, sir. Okay, Randy, you move, seconder, seconder. Joan, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Then we have some correspondence from uh, Darkin. Thank you from them. Can I have a motion to receive our correspondence for information? Mover Mark, seconder Adam, all in favor? Carried. Then application, uh, we'll move over to uh, receive the applications uh, 16806 uh, that were approved by the executive. Move over to do that, please. Move over Adam, seconder, seconder someone. Miriam, anybody have any questions on the applications? All in favor? That's carried. Any questions, Carrie? Do we have any questions from the public? No, no, anyone? Chair. Anyone online? No one? We have no in camera, the motion to adjourn at five o'clock. Adam will not motion. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>